So at this point, I'm going to assume everyone can see the screen there. Uh, that says wounded knee at the top. Um, yes, we can. Uh, good. It's a great pleasure for me to uh, to speak with everyone tonight, and um, it's really nice to see some of the Del the Delval people uh, in the audience there too. Um, Rich can fight over which organization's better. What I've learned is there's great people in, in both organizations and all historical organizations. Just being around people involved in history is always a is always a good experience. Um, so tonight we are going to talk about the Wounded Knee Massacre. And it does get a little bit complicated, as I was saying earlier to the group, that um, this massacre does not happen in a vacuum. It takes about 40 years or so of different events and tragedies and absolute massacres before that uh, to get the wounded knee. And that's really, uh, we're going to have to get through some of that first to, uh, to fully understand why the massacre happened. And so much of the massacre or, or what's happening to the Native Americans, um, it has to do with the lower the pictures there, that the buffalo and land. Um, it's about the Black Hills in that area of South Dakota, and the buffalo is being uh, really annihilated at that time for various reasons. The, the two photographs to the left, that's actually the, uh, the burial ground where these uh, Native Americans that were killed at uh, Wounded Knee are, are buried today with the memorial and the sign there in the center. Um, depicting exactly uh, exactly what happened. Mostly what we're talking about here with the massacre is the, uh, the Great Sioux Nation, uh, which is made of three groups, the Dakota, the Lakota, and the Nakota. And a lot of what we're gonna talk about are Lakota, um, the Lakota part of the, uh, of the Sioux, or known as the Teton Sioux. And a lot of uh, that group, uh, I don't want to get into too much detail here, the Aglala and the Minikanju, uh, we'll be talking about quite a bit too. The Sioux, they have a, a definite reputation. There's no doubt about that. Uh, they're known as great hunters, very brave warriors. They could fight with the best of them. Um, they had very strict community rules and family rules. The home or the TP, it was ruled uh, by, by the woman. They believed in one God, the great mystery, a walk in Tonka, and uh, the group that we're talking about here today resides in and around the Black Hills, parts of Dakota, Nebraska, well, South Dakota mostly, um, Nebraska, Wyoming, and um, Montana. This all gets started, I'm going to go back to 1830 when they built this little trading post known as Fort William. It's a really a trading post that serves the overland fur trade. Um, but in 1849, that gets a little bit more complicated because of gold. Gold is discovered. The nation is already expanding westward. Uh, that happens actually earlier than this, but gold is discovered, and there's suddenly a lot more people uh, traveling westward uh, to the Oregon Trail and, and across the plains where these, uh, the Sioux Nation really resides. And this Fort William, it's also known as Fort John, eventually becomes known as Fort Laramie. It's simply a trading post, but everyone out there is using it, including the Native Americans. We have trappers, traders, there's missionaries traveling west, there's immigrants, there's soldiers and miners using it, um, there's even homesteaders out there. So everyone that's in the region is using uh, Fort Laramie, but the more and more people that travel out there, the more and more complicated it gets. Between the 18, from the mid-1830s to about 1869, about 400,000 people travel, travel westward there, many of them across the Oregon Trail. And really complicating that there's other trails, the offshoots, there's the California Trail, the Mormon Trail takes you into Utah, and the Bozeman Trail. And the gold really has a lot to do with this. Um, call it greed, call it people looking for their... Uh, they're nest egg, but they're traveling more and more. And one thing that really became a problem a couple of years ago, we may, have, we may not have thought of this, um, but these Native Americans that are living there, they have no immunities against these diseases that the white people are carrying across the country. And it doesn't take long before these diseases and illnesses really have an impact, a negative impact uh, on these Native American communities. Uh, certainly, certainly struggling um, throughout the time that the uh, Americans were traveling westward. This, this becomes an issue. 
becomes an issue so much so that, that the Native Americans, they begin to, uh, to inflict some harm on some of these travelers. People die, people are injured. The Native Americans are asking the government for help. And it just seems to get worse and worse as time goes on. So in 1851, we have something known as the Fort Laramie Treaty. And this treaty was supposed to last, as they said, as long as the river flows and the eagle flies. Well, that's a pretty long time, but it really didn't work out that way. The treaty, it's signed between the government and multiple tribes uh, in the plains, including the Sioux. And the treaty said that the plain tribes must allow the people traveling west to pass safely. Um, that was to stop some of the carnage that was being created. It also said that the Native Americans must allow the government to build additional roads and forts. In exchange, the United States would pay $50,000 a year to the tribes for 10 years. Now, let me remind you, this is 1851. $50,000 is a lot of money. Um, the big one, and this was, this was a problem immediately, the tribal nations had to agree not to wage war on each other. They were constantly at war with each other, the different tribes, and that became a problem. And uh, it actually became a little more complicated because these chiefs did not speak English and the uh, treaties were merely explained to them. Um, but these grounds and stuff that we're talking about, you see it in the map in the lower right hand corner, it takes in a large area. Uh, you got a corner of Montana there, Wyoming, Nebraska, just about half of South Dakota and part of North Dakota. So we're talking about a lot of ground and it's on the US government to enforce the rules. And they simply were either unable or unwilling or both. There was really very little enforcement uh, from the beginning. And the picture there in the upper right hand corner is actually a photograph of the uh, remains that are still there. Um, at Fort Laramie today. As I said, these, these, the government never really controlled things and it was becoming more and more of an issue than it was before that treaty was signed. And in uh, August 19th, 1854, we have something known as the Grattan Massacre. Uh, we have a Lieutenant in the US Army, John Grattan. And apparently there was a Mormon group traveling across uh, the, the trails and one of their cows, uh, a cow or an ox, straight away. And uh, a Native American, uh, Minikanju, uh, in the Minikanju tribe, his name was High Forehead, he seized that cow when it wandered away. And of course, he was going to use it, and they were going to eat from it, and it became a problem. And the Sioux wanted these, um, this cow and the person held responsible uh, to be brought to justice. Well, Lieutenant Grattan decided that he was going to take 29 of his soldiers and they were going to walk into this camp and they were going to take this, the cow was already dead, but they were going to seize this, uh, this Native American high forehead and bring him to justice. Well, it gets a lot of complicated, a little complicated because the, um, the army really didn't have that right. That should have been up to the um, Indian um, police, as they called them at that time. You're going to hear the word Indian quite a bit tonight. I'm not, I'm not a really politically correct person. This is the terminology used at the time. And if I'm going to talk about the time, I like to talk about it the way uh, it was talked about then. Um, but there were Indian agencies, as they were called, that should have been handling that. Well, it got a little bit confusing because the civilian interpreter, Lucian August, he was actually, some people say, drunk. And he was looking for trouble. Lieutenant Grattan actually had a little bit of an attitude. And he had a feeling, and this is his words, that with 10 men, he could conquer the entire Indian nation. Um, he might've had a little bit of George Armstrong Custer in him. Well, on this day with himself and his civilian interpreter and 29 soldiers, he decided to start a little fight uh, with 1,200 Sioux warriors in the camp. Um, the chief there is chief conquering there. And um, in the middle of the argument and the discussion, chief conquering bear was shot uh, by a US soldier and killed and the fight immediately happens and in a pretty short amount of time. The 29, all 29 soldiers, Grattan and his civilian interpreter are all killed. They call it the Grattan Massacre. And in the lower right hand corner, that's Chief Red Cloud. And he is really a well respected that person. And um, usually in the process of trying to make peace, but 
towards the end, uh, as you'll see later, his whole attitude changes and he kind of gets tired of what's going on. Um, but the Grattan massacre is a big deal. I'd like to point something out. In doing my studies, and as, as all of you know, the victors write the stories when the, when the wars are over. And it seems like whenever I read about soldiers being killed, it was always a massacre. And whenever I read about Native Americans being killed, even men, women, even children, and babies and women, that for some reason was called a battle. Um, we're actually doing a pretty good job today of changing some of that. But this is what's known as the Grattan Massacre. And um, it hit home hard. And some people had a real, a real concern now. One of those people 13 months later is a General William S. Harney. And William S. Harney had made a statement, as I said, 13 months after the Grattan Massacre. You can see it there up top in red. Harney ordered an attack and he said, and excuse my language, this is a quote, those damn red sons of bitches who massacred the soldiers near Laramie last year, don't spare one of them. And he's talking about the, uh, the massacre we just talked about, the Grattan Massacre. Um, they go into the, uh, the camp. We now have Chief Conqueror Bear, uh, who replaced the, um, the Native American chief who was killed in the Grattan Massacre. He does survive. He is wounded. But this is an absolute massacre. But I just said when the Native Americans are killed, they tend to call it a battle. And towards the lower center there, you'll see this is the Battle of Blue Water. It's also known as Ash Hollow. The American soldiers kill about 100 Lakotas, but over half of them are women and children. The gentleman there on the lower left-hand corner, and anyone who, ever, who has ever visited Gettysburg and walked up the little round top, you know that gentleman. Uh, he's standing there in the big statue with the binoculars. At this time, he is at the uh, Blue Water or Ash Hollow. That's uh, Lieutenant uh, Governor Warren. And he said of this massacre, wounded women and children crying and, mo and moaning, horribly mangled by the bullets. Lieutenant Warren at this point was extremely uh, upset about what he witnessed here uh, under General Harney's command. It gets a lot more complicated in 1859 when more and more gold is being discovered. And just in 1859 alone, over 100,000 people travel west through these lands. Um, it's all about gold. But now all these travelers, they're having a severe impact uh, on the Native American way of life, on their hunting grounds. The buffalo is already being annihilated. It's unable for me to confirm this, but when my wife and I visited out there uh, a little bit over a year ago, we were told in two different museums that during these years, there were between 30 and 35 million buffalo. Eventually, they were down to under a thousand. That buffalo was critical to the Native American way of life, and it certainly had an impact. So now their hunting grounds are being destroyed, their land is being destroyed, and it's simply very difficult. They're, they're, they're still dealing with disease that they have no immunities against, and it's becoming very difficult. And the Native Americans are taking their shots at some of these travelers. Um, there are travelers and settlers being killed, and it just continues uh, to get more and more complicated as time goes on. So it's going to bring us to another um, massacre, uh, or what I will refer to um, as a massacre. It's the Sand Creek Massacre. And this happens in 18, this happens in 1864. With the Sand Creek Massacre, we have a Colonel John Shivington from the 3rd uh, Colorado Cavalry. This was an absolute, this, this, this one really is a bit of a disgrace. Um, Shivington acts like he's going to walk in to a Black Kettle, Chief Black Kettle camp. There was an understanding when the, the Native Americans in their camp, if they saw the military coming, they would fly a white flag and an American flag. That meant they wanted peace and they were not looking for trouble. Shivington traveled right into that camp with the understanding that he would have a conversation with Black Kettle and other Native Americans there, but the entire time his troops were surrounding the camp. 
Shiving Tim went in, had his discussion, and as he left the camp, he gave the order to attack. These are actually Cheyenne, they're not the Lakota or Sioux. These are Cheyenne here, but it plays into the whole story of what's happening. By the time this ends, at least, at least 150 Cheyenne are killed, and again, more than half are women, children, and babies. Black Kettle actually said, I once thought that I was the only man that persevered to be the friend of the white man, but it's hard for me to believe the white man anymore. Shivington was actually drummed out of the army. Um, and it, in the lower left-hand corner there, there was an investigation and an army judge stated, a cowardly and cold-blooded slaughter sufficient to cover its perpetrators with indelible infamy and the face of every American with shame and indignation. They're pretty powerful words. I said earlier about battle versus massacre. In the upper right hand corner, you can see the little a monument or marker there, the Sand Creek Battleground. This is a case where Native Americans are killed. That's now a National Park Service site. And in their site there, or their sign, they do correct it. And they refer to it as the Sand Creek Massacre um, National Historic Site. But I really believe the Army judge here really, uh, his words, his words speak volumes about what happened there. It's very sad. We're going to keep going back and forth, and that's what's happening. And we have another um, American soldier here, Captain William Fetterman. Um, he was a pretty aggressive guy, too. But in this case, he was set up. And he is set up by Crazy Horse. You all know the name. Crazy Horse and I know other warriors know that if they run by Fetterman's camp there, that Fetterman would give chase. And Crazy Horse and these nine or 10 warriors did, did trot on by, and Fetterman with 81 soldiers with him um, decided to chase uh, Crazy Horse and the other warriors. They chased them right into a trap as they came over a ridge. And again, within minutes, within minutes, all 81 of them are killed. Two things I would point out here, the lower left-hand corner, uh, that's the picture of the Crazy Horse Memorial that's still being built. The reason I use that memorial is I, am, I, I hear from a few different places, including the University of Nebraska, that there was no confirmed photograph of Crazy Horse. There was one photograph right now that people, many people do believe is him, but it's not absolutely confirmed. So rather than use that photograph, I'm going to use the photograph here of the mine that I took uh, when my wife and I visited. And this place has an amazing museum. Uh, we were probably in there for four hours one day, and then a couple of days later, we went back again. Um, I mentioned Red Cloud earlier. And Red Cloud, he was kind of getting tired of the massacres. And when he was asked about this, he said, when the great father, and by great father, he means the president, in this case, Johnson, he said, when the great father of Washington sent us his chief soldier, General Harney, to ask for a path through our hunting grounds, a way for his iron road to the mountain and the Western Sea, we were told that they wished merely to pass through our country. Yet before the ashes of the Count of Fire are cold, the great father is building forts among us. His presence here is an insult and a threat. So Crazy Horse had turned. And um, he was more uh, in a, in a, let's have a, let's have a, a war mindset too. Things are unraveling terribly. Um, so we get now to the second Fort Laramie Treaty of 1868. For you Civil War folks there, there's a meeting taking place on the top. You'll see the arrow. That is William Tecumseh Sherman sitting there. And he kind of understood the situation of what the Indians were dealing with at this time. He certainly changed to the other side. Uh, as we got towards the end, but he said, while the Indian reservation is a parcel of land that is set aside for the exclusive use of the Indian and is surrounded by thieves, he understood what was taking place. Now, this treaty is a pretty strong treaty. It guaranteed the Lakota Sioux ownership of the Black Hills and the Dakotas, and I'm going to stress that word guaranteed because it's critical to the end of the presentation. It also gave the, the Sioux hunting rights on other, in other areas or other grounds. The gold miners entering the territory 
would violate the treaty, and it was absolutely expected without a doubt that the U.S. Army would remove these violators. It was on the Army to enforce that treaty. And here is the most critical part of the treaty that you'll hear about in a while. If the Native Americans were to surrender any more ground, three-fourths of all Indian males must agree and they must sign if any land was be turned over to the United States. So I want to stress that. Three quarters of all Indian males must agree. That's critical to the end of the story. The true reality is that the treaty provided land to the Indians, the reservations, and the surrender of a lot of, a lot of their other tribal lands to the United States of America. But the Black Hills still are secure in this treaty. Now, you know, today we have Mount Rushmore sitting there in the Black Hills. At this point, the buffalo continues to be annihilated, literally wiped from the plains, so much so that in 1870, Red Cloud, along with a couple other chiefs, visits Washington, D.C. and New York. He does that so he can try to explain what the Indian struggles are on these reservations. They're dying from sickness. They're starving. It, their housing is poor. It's not a good situation. But he is absolutely overwhelmed by what he sees. And when he leaves and goes back to the plains, he says he is convinced that the Indians will never overcome the United States government power and size. And he was absolutely right in his mindset. I mentioned there are these Indian agencies. And these Indian agencies, you see them in the upper right-hand corner there, that's actually the Pine Ridge, members of the Pine Ridge Indian Agency. They had a responsibility to assure that the Indians received the food and goods that they were promised and that they needed to, to survive on the reservation. They could not survive with it now without the government help. So we had in the Pine Ridge area and Red Cloud Agency 1, 2, and 3, and they are eventually combined um, into the, in 1878 to what is now known as the, was then known as the Pine Ridge Agency. Pine Ridge is the reservation, still is to this day, uh, where the Wounded Knee Massacre takes place. Those gentlemen in the lower left-hand corner, they are not Indian agents, but they explain the Indian agency and the Native American plight more than I ever could in a hit song in 1971. That's Paul Revere and the Raiders. And they said, and I want to quote their song, they took the whole Cherokee Nation, put us on this reservation, took away our ways of life, the tomahawk and the bow and knife, took away our native tongue. They taught their English to our young. And all the beads we made by hand are nowadays made in Japan. They took the whole Indian nation, locked us on this reservation. And though I wear a shirt and tie, I'm still part red man deep inside. I don't know if you can explain this problem um, more than they explained it in that song. So now we have the big battle, the Battle of Little Bighorn. And this is one that the Native Americans win. They win the battle, but this is the beginning of the end for them. Sure, all of you know, this is George Armstrong Custer. He splits his army into three, uh, uh, three, three pieces. Again, you have Crazy Horse. There are other well-known Native Americans there also. And about, well, 210 of Custer, men and himself, are killed, members of the U.S. 7th Cavalry. It's also important too, that U.S. 7th, that will come up later. I also want to point that date out. It's June 25th and 26th, 1876. That's a week and a half before the 100th birthday of independence in the United States. The nation was floored by this news and what they actually referred to as a massacre at the time. Congress, upon hearing this, Congress immediately demands, they demand that the Native Americans surrender any rights to all lands other than the reservation. And they also threaten that all U.S. aid will be stopped and disease is now out of control and the extermination of Buffalo is, is getting close to complete. 
the Native Americans are in deep trouble here. But again, I want to point out that Article 12 of 1868 Treaty that guaranteed the Lakota Sioux ownership of the Black Hills and the Dakotas, and three-fourths of all Indian males must agree to sign over the land to the United States. Congress didn't want to hear that now. They wanted the land, and they began the process of rounding up the Native Americans and putting them on reservations. So we get to 1880, and there's really only two thoughts now. The first thought is the humanitarian thought. And the mindset was through education and religion, the Indians could be assimilated into a more dominant white society. You see the picture in the upper right-hand corner. They're wearing the white man's clothes. In the top center there, um, you see the teacher. She's teaching English, and the children are not wearing Native American clothing. The picture on the left shows you, lower left shows you the, the white man's clothes and the Indian, uh, the Native American clothing. They're actually teaching religion, uh, uh, Christianity and Judaism. At the time, they're teaching the Bible. There's two very important people in this humanitarian thought process. One is Dr. Charles Eastman. He is a Lakota Sioux uh, who goes to, I'm not sure if it's Boston College now, Slip My Mind or Boston University, and then he goes on to Dartmouth, and he becomes a doctor, and he goes back to Pine Ridge Reserva Reservation uh, to treat the sick. Um, there's also Elaine Goodale Eastman, she actually marries Dr. Eastman after the massacre, and she's responsible for education of the Native Americans. She's the superintendent of Indian education. She actually lived all the way to 1953. But there's a second mindset by the 1880s, and that's the force. And the force was pretty simple. Use of force to subjugate, and if necessary, annihilate what was considered an inferior race. They actually considered the humanitarian idea sentimental nonsense. And by this point, I mentioned earlier, William Tecumseh Sherman, by this point, he falls in uh, to that second category. But that happens when you're at war and a lot of people are dying. You will certainly change your opinions of something, of some things. The late 1880s, something happens it, in, in today's contemporary mindset. This sounds bizarre but it's really what led up to the um, massacre. There's a gentleman comes along, Wu Vaca. He's also known as Jack Wilson. And he starts to tell a story um, that he talked to the gods and prophets and that the Native Americans should do a dance called the ghost dance. And I wanna point out at this point, they are dying from influenza, from measles, from whooping cough, these diseases ravage the reservation. They're not being fed, they're starving. The United States is threatening to cut 25% of the beef they were sending. And this uh, Wu Vaca says, if you do this ghost dance, that all non-Indians would be destroyed and removed from the earth, that the earth would be renewed and all of the abundant game would reappear. The buffalo would come back and all deceased Indian ancestors would return to life. Chief Bigfoot is a big believer in this, a very big believer in this, as our other uh, sitting bull is a big believer in it. You can see that the painting there, that's the dance. It actually would get quite out of control and they would grab dust from the ground and grow it in the air. And that, that, that kind of was dust to dust. And when they threw that dust in the air, they, that's how the deceased Native Americans would return. Red Cloud was very concerned about this dance. He feared the dance would bring attacks because the soldiers were very intimidated by this. In fact, the non-soldiers, everybody was intimidated by it, uh, that wasn't doing it. But also Red Cloud believed, believed that, the, uh, that the Native Americans had a right to do this dance. He compared it to Christianity and as a part of the Native American religion. And therefore he, uh, he thought they should keep doing the dance even though he greatly feared it would bring attacks. A chief Bigfoot is, is a, a Sioux war, a, a chief there, and he, as I said earlier, is a big believer in this, and this actually plays in to the massacre. This ghost dance is getting so out of control. In 1890, President Benjamin Harrison decides he's had enough. They were really concerned that something was going to go wrong, so he sends six to 7,000 United States Army troops into the Lakota reservations. 
should point out this is the largest military mobilization since the Civil War. And uh, the, the, the tribal police or the Indian agencies, as I mentioned earlier, they were not in a position at all to control this. So that was going to be the job of the US Army. And then they added something that complicated it even more. From the ghost dance, they then added the ghost shirt. And this was a shirt that if you wore, bullets could not penetrate, nothing could not penetrate it, and you could be protected. You could be protected uh, from anything that was thrown at you from the, uh, from the US Army. And there you see a picture in the lower left there um, from the University of Nebraska uh, of the troops there that were starting to, um, to organize in the, uh, in the wounded knee area. So we're still in 1890. We have General, General Nelson A. Miles. He's in charge of everything. And he was getting concerned. And he actually sent word that the region is liable to be overrun by a hungry, wild, mad horde of savages. But he believed in his heart that a good show of force would settle the Indians down. At this point, Chief Bigfoot is in the Badlands. It's a bit of a distance uh, from Pine Ridge Reservation. And um, he is very sick now. He's, uh, he's actually dying from pneumonia. That's a photograph there that I took and, and Bigfoot and his tribe was down in the lower valley there. And I gotta be honest with you, being there, I would not wanna be one of the people that had traveled down into that and find them um, because I, didn't, I wouldn't even wanna think about walking down there. But at some point that becomes the responsibility. Um, General Miles um, realizes he needs to do something and Chief Red Cloud, who is now concerned that Bigfoot's about to be wiped out. I should point out Bigfoot also is known as Spotted Elk. Chief Red Cloud sends word to Bigfoot that he should bring his people to Pine Ridge under the white flag and that they would be safe there. And you can see the arrow there in the lower right hand corner. That's the, the area where I actually have a nice sign there on the, uh, on the road there where my wife and I were explaining what happened and the journey and where they were traveling. So Nelson A. Miles at some point, he's somewhat glad to hear that Bigfoot's gonna to come to Pine Ridge, um, but he's not at ease in, in any way, shape or form. So we're gonna send Colonel Edwin V. Sumner Jr. And for those Antietam fans that are listening, um, yes, that is the son of the General Sumner that we know from Antietam. He's with the 8th U.S. Cavalry. And he was seeking peace. So he sends word that I have held a council with all the principal chiefs in this section of the country and find they are peaceably disposed and inclined to obey orders. I believe they are really hungry and suffering from want, clothing, and covering. I advise that 1,000 rations be sent to me at once for issue to them and authority to purchase a certain amount of fresh beef. Colonel Sumner saw the problem and he was trying to resolve it. Just after he sends that word, he is immediately ordered to seize Bigfoot as a hostile. There's an Indian agent, James McLaughlin, who is seriously concerned because on December 15th, it's only a couple of weeks before the massacre, Sitting Bull is killed in his reservation, killed by the Indian agents, the Indian police, who were sent there to arrest him. Sitting Bull also was a big believer in the ghost dance, and, and many of his warriors escaped and they join up in the Badlands um, with Bigfoot. So this greatly complicates the concern um, that these troops are having on whether or not Bigfoot is actually peaceful or not. So we get to December 28, 1890. Bigfoot sends word to Pine Ridge Reservation that he will be arriving. But when his messengers return to him, they tell him that immediately upon giving the word, that the soldiers moved for the Wounded Knee Trading Post. I'm gonna apologize for a second because I still don't know the proper pronunciation of this major's name. I don't know if it's pronounced Whitside or Whiteside, so I don't wanna mispronounce it, so it's one or the other. But he meets with Bigfoot, or he sends word that Bigfoot and his people should come to Wounded Knee Creek. Bigfoot agrees and saying he is coming to make peace. But General Miles also sends orders and General Meyer says, or General Miles says, they are very defiant and hostile. If he fights, destroy him. Use force enough 
his Indians are very bad. So Miles kind of sets the tone that really, to be honest, which it was already set before he said that, but that complicates it again. So now we have Colonel James Forsythe of the U.S. 7th. Remember, this is the regiment that um, George Armstrong Custer was part of on um, that little bighorn. Forsythe's job is to arrive into, into this camp here at Wounded Knee, and he is to seize all of the Native American horses and all of the weapons. Well, you can see how complicated that's going to get. There's about 500 U.S. Army personnel there at Wounded Knee. Bigfoot has, uh, there's probably about 300 to 350 people there. 200 women, 200 of them are women and children and elderly. He has about 100 men of fighting age, but most of them are already disarmed at this point. And the big part of this battle is the lower right hand corner. This cavalry here had Hotchkiss guns, which fired an exploding shell. And here's the camp. If you look at the lower right hand corner of the map, you see right a little bit below the center of the picture, that's the Sioux camp. And you see the little maroon colored or brown colored teepees there. Well, just above them there is the cavalry camp. And just to the left there, there's a, there's a much higher hill. It's called Artillery Hill. That's where these Hotchkiss guns are set. And the troops really have this camp surrounded. And there's really nothing Bigfoot can do. Bigfoot is now really close to death. He's really suffering with pneumonia. He can't even get down. He can't even get off the ground. Um, the Indian camp, the Native American camp is completely surrounded. As I said, those Hotchkiss guns were on the hill and the Indians are ordered. Surrender your guns and your horses or else. General Forsythe, he gives word to his men that we are going to disarm these Indians and we are ordered to prevent the escape of any of them. If they fight, we are to destroy them. There's a little bit of a conflict here because when he sends word to the Native Americans, he says, I want to assure you, the mini Kanjus, that you and your people are perfectly safe under the protection of your older friends, the soldiers. They get to, the Native Americans get to Bigfoot. They tell him they want our guns and he tells them, just give them the bad ones. Well, a lot of, a lot of guns, as I said, were already surrendered. At this point, it's getting a little bit difficult. People are getting nervous, people are getting jumpy, and there's a medicine man in the camp known as Yellowbird. He begins to do the ghost dance, and then he starts chanting. He's throwing dirt into the air. He starts chanting, do not be afraid. Their bullets cannot penetrate us. Their bullets will drift, their bullets will drift away harmlessly. And there is panic. Panic is beginning to set in. When they go to this other Native American named Black Coyote, he is actually Sitting Bull's deaf mute son. He's standing there with a gun, and the soldiers, two soldiers tell him, we want the weapon. Well, he didn't obey the orders, and most likely he couldn't hear them, and he also could not understand them. He wrestled with the two soldiers, and the gun went off. That started it. There was complete panic at that point. I want to remind you that there are American soldiers in that camp confiscating these weapons. Well, those Hoskins guns up on that hill, they opened fire, and they opened fire on everybody. In the upper left-hand corner, you see Bigfoot. He's frozen solid in the snow. Three days after the massacre, it actually snowed for, for three days. Uh, they had a bit of a storm. On the lower left-hand corner, that's actually the burial ground. It's a mass grave site. That mass grave site is up on the hill where the Hoskins guns were set. Um, an interesting place. Looks like the right place to put it, uh, but it's an interesting place to do it. 270 to 300 Native Americans are killed in really minutes. Um, and I should point out that the 300 number comes from General Miles' report. But 170 to 200 are women and children. 25 soldiers are killed in the camp. Bigfoot said earlier, I will stand in peace until my last day comes. And he really did try to. Um, and to the left there, you see that certainly was his last day. Hugh McGinnis of the 7th Cavalry says, children and women with babies in their arms have been chased as far as two miles and cut down without mercy by the troops. I want to stress that. They were chased as far as two miles because that's going to come up in the next slide. 
Um, Captain Edward Goffrey says, there was not a living thing before us, warriors, squalls, children, ponies, and dogs all went down. As I said, the picture to the left is the, uh, it's now known as Cemetery Hill. That is the hill where the Hoskins guns were. Now there's gonna be a cover up and 20 medals of honor are awarded. And I want you to look at that top red block there. That's Thomas Sullivan. He wins the medal of honor for conspicuous bravery in action against Indians concealed in a ravine. It is known without a doubt that the Indians concealed in a ravine were the Native American women and children um, that ran two miles from the camp and were chased, um, unfortunately, by these soldiers. It's also a known fact that the vast majority of the 25 soldiers that died, died from friendly fire uh, from up on that hill. Um, none of this really today is in dispute. General Miles, who, although he said that the Indians were dangerous, was appalled at the, the killing of the women and children. Um, he actually made every attempt possible to remove foresight from the army. But Secretary of War Redfield Proctor exonerated foresight of any wrongdoing I wounded me. Um, as I said, there was quite a bit of a cover up here that lasted many years. Um, there was a, I just realized I screwed up on the first slide. There was a gentleman in that slide and I wanted to ask if anybody knew that gentleman. And I'm pretty convinced none of you know, or maybe very few would know that picture, but I'm willing to bet you that 100% of you know his work. That's L. Frank Baum. And he is the author of the original Wizard of Oz book. He was also uh, an editor, he owned a couple newspapers. And I don't, wanna, I don't wanna sound politically correct here, I'm not pointing him out. What he says is actually a common mindset at the time. But he published as a written editorial by himself in a newspaper after the massacre. These words are stunning, but it's not uncommon at this time. He says, having wronged them for centuries, we had better in order to protect our civilization follow it up by one more wrong and wipe these untamed and uh, these untamed and untamable creatures from the face of the earth they are stunning words but i would point out that we need to look at history through the era that it happened not through a contemporary mindset and in the era that it happened that was a bit of the mindset that was taking place there's a wonderful museum uh, it's quite a few miles, it's probably, I don't know exactly, probably about 90 miles or so from Wounded Knee. It's the Wounded Knee, the Wounded Knee Museum in Wall. And they have a plaque in that museum. It's a really great museum. Um, and that plaque shows you exactly what is on the memorial that's in the lower right. And it says Bigfoot. And from what I've read about Bigfoot, this is true. Bigfoot was a great chief of Sioux Indians. He often said, I will stand in peace till my last day comes. He did many good and brave deeds for the white man and the red man. Many innocent women and children who knew no wrong died here. I would point out that when you look at the memorial today in the grass grave site, it's, it, it, the, the mass grave site, it's pretty shabby. And I, I think that was my first impression and my wife's first impression. But the truth of the matter is, after being there, it kind of makes sense that it would look that way. I know the Park Service has been trying for years to take over the site and put a museum in, uh, but the Native American and the Sioux tribe will have nothing to do with that. Um, so it is just a small thing, but it's, uh, it's very humbling. It's extremely humbling uh, to stand there. As I said, the center picture there, that's the mass burial site uh, where the monument is. Now you also see something, and I was touched by this. I, I always look for ironies when I visit places and the irony in this case is despite this massacre, just outside the fence of the, of the uh, mass burial ground site there, you see this, the tombstone of an American soldier. And I'll talk about that more in a minute. There were three tombstones. I didn't look at the other two because I didn't want to just tread through the, uh, through the cemetery grounds like that. But I did, I did take a look at this one and the name, the name piqued my interest. So today, you see this lower, the lower left-hand corner we talked earlier about, is it a massacre or a battle? Well, in this case, the words massacre there, that's a little plaque. That sign used to say battle of wounded knee, but they covered that up with a little plaque that now says massacre. 
And the actual site of the massacre is just behind me, uh, where you see the tree line. Uh, that's, uh, that's down in a ravine um, where the, the Native American camp was. If you look at that photo of me, the, I'm looking up at the hill. And from that picture you see in the upper right hand corner what I'm looking at. So you can see where the Hoskins guns were set. They certainly had the high ground. It was really the only high ground in the immediate location of the camp there. The hills you see in the back behind me, that was uh, too far away. And there in the lower right is the entrance uh, to, the, um, to the mass burial site. But I have to stress, we're getting to the end now. This is not over. This land that was promised, this is really ironic to me also. This land that was promised in that second Laramie Treaty, it consists of 7,300,000 acres. Lower left-hand corner, I could tell you that the buffalo are back. Uh, one of the lodges we stayed in had about 1,500 buffalo on their ground. And that's still the Black Hills there in the upper right-hand corner. Um, I, we talked earlier about the Crazy Horse Monument and obviously Mount Rushmore, a sign of American power, uh, sits on those grounds. But why isn't it over? Well, it's not over because since 1904, there were numerous legal cases over that treaty. And for those lawyers in the room, if you don't notice, some of it's very interesting to look at. Before I get into that legal case, I want to point to that gentleman's tombstone. He's a Vietnam vet. He died in 2005. His name is Nathan W. Elk. I wanted to point out earlier that I pointed out that Bigfoot is spotted elk. And I'm working on finding out if this gentleman, Nathan W. Elk, is, in, is a relation to him. I was told when we were out there that the vast majority of the people living on the Pine Ridge Reservation today have ancestors who were killed uh, during the massacre. So um, I haven't quite figured that out, but it is, it does pose an interesting question for me anyway. But it's still not over, as I said. I'm talking about 7,300,000 acres in 1980. It goes all the way to the United States Supreme Court. In 1980, the US Supreme Court says, a more rank, ripe and rank case of dishonorable dealings will never in all probability be found in our history. That's some pretty serious words from the Supreme Court about what happened at Wounded Knee. So what did they do? In 1980, they award the Sioux tribe $106 million. Nothing's that simple. That money has never been claimed for two reasons. The Native American tribes say, we don't want your money. We want our land. No one can own the land. It's our land by right. And you can't just take it gives our land back. Well, obviously that's not happening. And there was also, and I'm not sure it's been settled yet. There was a case against the lawyers or the law firm. Um, they got 10% of the, um, the award. And they were sued because of some things that happened in the case. And to my knowledge, that has not been settled. This money is sitting in a trust fund. And as of 2011, it's now worth $1.3 billion. And you scratch your head when you drive through that reservation because they are extremely poor people. They are rich in pride and principle, but financially there are some extremely poor people and there's $1.3 billion sitting there. So it, it's interesting. And it'd be interesting to pay a little more attention to this in the future and see if it ever goes anywhere else. So that does complete my presentation. So Dave, I'm going to hand it back to you if we have time for questions, we can do that. 